Boker Tov Givrin. Boker Tov. Mashlom Kim. Oh, I've heard a few Tov Meodes even. That's great. All right, it's a good day. It's nice and cool out. And uh, everyone should be refreshed this morning and eager to finish up the week and to finish it up well. We were spending time on diagramming. That's what we're going to continue to do today. Uh, we were looking at 1 Samuel chapter 16. You can see on the screen what we've done thus far. We've gone through uh, verse 1, diagramming the dialogue in a box, going on down further and doing verse 2 with its dialogues, two different dialogues there, along with one that is an internal dialogue uh, where you have uh, what Samuel is to say to the elders uh, of the city when he comes there at Bethlehem. And then in, uh, or excuse me, not Bethlehem, uh, verse 4, we had uh, narrative except for the question asked by one of the elders of the city who uh, asked him if he came in peace. And then verse 5, we had begun it and we'd started the dialogue and I want to uh, finish up that. And uh, verse 6, before we then go back and take a look at some of the uh, details of trying to uh, see how we can refine it and then deal with your questions that you might have with regard to either the mechanics of it or the philosophy of diagramming. So let's continue on in verse 5. We have thus far, uh, so he said or responded, peace. This is Samuel's response to the question from the uh, elder in the city. Peace for sacrifice to Yahweh I have come. And then he continues on in this statement to direct Jesse, this would be Bethlehem, to direct Jesse and uh, those with him to sanctify themselves. So we have a command, sanctify yourselves. Notice it's in the plural, a hithpa'el, and it's a perfect third common plural. And we're going to put it on the same order of uh, relationship to the preceding line and the preceding part of his dialogue. And then, uh, and come with me into the sacrifice, going all the way through the Athnac. And we'll pick that up and bring it up here. And we're going to have to select this uh, cell and adjust its borders in order to make certain it all fits. And that concludes the dialogue that he speaks at that time because the very next thing we have is a way toll verb. And uh, we're going to pick it up along with the dual direct objects. And I'm going to put them down below here so that we can uh, pull all of it together. So he sanctified, or thus he sanctified, or then he sanctified Jesse and his sons. We're going to pick that up and bring it up here, drop it in, and I see that I've uh, lost a word space there that I need to include. So I'm going to insert that to get the two direct objects separated from each other. And we might as well put our text box in now, and on my drawing uh, toolbar, I pick up the uh, box, I ignore the palette, I don't like it, and I'm going to then put it in here, use my alt key to make my fine tune adjustments, then remove the uh, fill for the box so that everything shows through, and then we can go back down here and we can pick up the remainder of uh, verse 5, uh, and he invited them or he summoned them, depending on how you're interpreting the context, to the sacrifice. And I'm going to go ahead and add in an extra line even though we may not use it later. And we've got it done here and I see I've got one error already and that is that I uh, pasted in text parallel to uh, the dialogue and I want to make certain I get that taken care of. 
So let's go up and pick all this up. No, it isn't. It just it was this evidently just a screen view. But my box disappeared. Interesting. Let's see what happens. There we go. Get that box up out of the way. Sometimes when you add a row, if you're too close to a graphic like a box like that, the box gets tagged along because of the anchor point. So you have to go back and look at it again. I use control Z a lot <laughs> to uh, undo what I just did so I can see what happened. Uh, sometimes I find that my cursor was in the wrong place or something of that nature. All right, I'm going to save it. And we're going to put in the verse number for verse 6. And since I wanted to get it out of the way as well, I'm going to go ahead and do that. That dark line there is just the bottom of the page. If I uh, take a good look at the view here of it and get the print view, I can get those separated that way where there's a space between the pages and don't think I have a line there. Okay. Wayahi vevoam is so it came to pass when they entered or while they were entering. You could translate this instead of initiating a uh, new sequence. Wayahi is often used in a macro syntactic fashion. And in a place like this, you could just use it as a temporal adverbial clause and say, ignore Wayahi, basically, and translate Bevoam as uh, when they entered, he saw. So that you don't translate either one of the wows on these two Wayahi tolls. Uh, when they entered, he saw. Let's see if I got all that. No, I didn't get it. Pardon? Uh, there is a quarter div uh, division there. You have the uh, Zakhev Katon. No. No. We're going to put it in this way. When they entered, he saw. We're going to take it and pull it down here. We're going to go up and take that out. He saw Eliab. And he said, and this takes us over to a second page now of our diagram. And that's going to happen with a long text like what we have here. And then what he said was, indeed, before Yahweh is his anointed. So it's a simple statement. It'll be an easy one to do. And we're going to put it in here. And I'm going to have to get this. All right. That's roughly where it was at, I believe, in the ones above. And we'll go ahead and put a box around it so it's taken care of. Actually, I don't have to put a box, excuse me, because the fact that uh, we have just one cell for the statement, so I'm just going to go back here and I'm going to go to the Format menu, go to the Borders menu, select Box to put it around it a box. I should have done one other thing and that is to uh, select the size of the line because we need a thicker line to go around it to match what's above. All right with that we'll save that and we're going to go back up to the start and we're going to talk about fine-tuning this. Barry, yes sir. Could you show the end part of that again? Uh, what, what do you want to see? Just the, the last Part of the diagram. I, I just show the diagram. Just, just show it. <coughs> a verse six, like that. 
Uh, okay, well, let me, let me do this because it's in the page above where we have verse 6. Let me separate verse 6 out uh, completely. And, uh, okay, I'm going to insert a page break here. Insert a break, page break, so that verse 6 is all on the same page where you can see it more readily. Like that? Okay. I've got the three Wayyik toll verbs vertical above one another. We'll come back and talk about that because the first one, as I mentioned, can be diagrammed as a temporal clause defining the second one. It's an exception to the sequential rule of Wayyik toll. And then I have the statement, the dialogue, Ak Neged Yahweh Meshicho. All right? All okay. right. Okay. Now let's go back up to verse 1 and let's talk a little bit about refining. When we talk about refinement on a logical diagram, it all becomes a matter of personal choice and personal preference. Remember that diagramming is done in order to visualize the text. I don't know about you, but I'm a visual learner. There are three kinds of learners. There are audio learners. They hear something and they've learned it. Uh, they only hear it, need to hear it once perhaps to hear it, to uh, know it. They don't want to be shown it because that's confusing at times. They just want to hear it. You tell me and I can do it. You tell me and I know it. That's an audio learner. Uh, they're a rare breed, but they do exist. A lot of us are visual learners. We don't want to just hear it, we want it shown to us, show me. And that's why I use a lot of charts and diagrams. I like to visualize and I learn better if someone visualizes it for me. That's why I use PowerPoint because I'm a visual learner and I use those methods by which I learn. And then it's hopefully it's a help to those of you who are visual learners. Those who are audio learners, you're sitting here and you're just listening and you're not taking any notes, you're not uh, taking any diagrams or anything else, you're an audio learner, you take it all in your hearing, you remember it like a tape recorder, you play it back later in your mind and you're fine. Uh, but uh, most of us have to see something. We have to take some notes, we have to see it, we have to reread it, we have to diagram, we have to draw pictures for ourselves or someone has to draw pictures for us. Then there are those of you who are kinesthetic learners. Kinesthetic learners don't learn by just hearing. They don't learn even if you add the visual. They have to do it themselves. So they're the ones that uh, I can stand up here and I can show you how to do this and you can see it and I can talk about it and we can answer questions. But unless you actually put it into the computer yourself and actually do the diagram yourself, it doesn't mean a thing to you. You can walk out of here and to you it's zero. It's nothing. Uh, we just spent uh, three hours of, uh, um, for you, meaningless activity because you have to do it yourself, right? And so if you're a kinesthetic learner, you need to devise things in order for you to, help to learn Hebrew or to learn anything. You've got to play games with yourself. You've got to put sticky notes on your mirror. You've got to uh, make by hand your own uh, vocabulary cards rather than purchasing them, rather than using a computer flash card type of assembly. Uh, you need to create them yourself. You need to do it by hand. You're a kinesthetic learner. Uh, you're the ones that learn from, when, from the occasions when I bring my Hebrew uh, uh, word games in and you get to play Hebrew Scrabble. Uh, you learn as much in doing that as you do in reading the textbook, doing the exercises and everything else because it allows you to do something in which you use your hands, use your eyes and everything else to put it together. You're a kinesthetic learner. Uh, if you're a kinesthetic learner, it's a challenge to you to learn a language because you have to devise ways because the professors don't always help you out in devising ways to help you do it. Uh, you're going to have to, when you're traveling, as I had one student who was a kinesthetic learner, when he was traveling during the summer with his wife and he had the road map out and he would give her directions and she would drive, he would sit over in the, driver's, uh, in the passenger seat, he'd get the map out and he'd start taking every word on the map and converting them to Hebrew letters to transliterate it. 
And uh, if it said mountains, he'd put in harim. And that's the way he would learn Hebrew. That's the way he retained vocabulary, is that constant usage. He made up games for himself. He's still doing it today. Talked to him uh, last week. He's still doing the same types of things. So if you're a kinesthetic learner, uh, you've got a lot of work to do. And you've got to be creative, and you've got to find ways to, to get that in. But this is for the purpose of visualizing. It's for visualizing. If you're a kinesthetic learner, diagramming will help you if you do it yourself. Because you are manipulating the text. You are rearranging the text. You're trying to get it to where it means something to you. It says something to you. Now, you can tell by the uh, last diagram on the handout that was diagrammatical analysis of the Hebrew text. If you look at that last diagram on Psalm 15, there is an English outline on the left-hand side. Now, that's what my sermon notes look like, except I get them all marked up by hand by the time I get them into the pulpit. But that's what my sermon notes are. When I preach from the Old Testament, I go in and in the pulpit, if you come up, you'll find a Hebrew diagram, a logical diagram. Because as I'm preaching, I can look down and I can visualize, I can see the arrangement of the text. I use colors, I use boxes, I use lines, I use notes in various colors as well. I it, because it's all visualized for me. And that way as I look down and see something, I know, for example, if I have a chiasm, where the focus is because I can see it visually. I just don't have in my notes, this is a chiasm. I can see the chiasm because the chiasm is mapped out for me in the Hebrew on my notes in front of me. This is what I utilize and it has to be visual because as I glance down, I want to see immediately what the text is doing. I want to see immediately where the repetitions are. I want to see what word is repeated. I want to see what it is in the Hebrew, not just an English translation of it. I want to know that. And so I use these diagrams for that type of purpose. I use it for teaching, yes, but I use it for preaching. They go into the pulpit with me. So as we're looking at this first verse, we have, Yomer Yahweh el Shemuel. So Yahweh said, to Samuel. And we're going to find out it's a question, so we could translate it. So Yahweh, or then Yahweh asked Samuel. Now El Shemuel is a prepositional phrase. Prepositional phrases are adverbial in nature. Most prepositional phrases are adverbial. There will be maybe 10% of them that won't be, that will be instead adjectival. But 90% of prepositional phrases in the Hebrew Bible will be adverbial. Therefore, they're going to modify a verb, another adverb, or an adjective, because that's what adverbs modify. In this case, El Shemuel is going to adverbially modify the verb by specifying to whom Yahweh speaks. That is known as an indirect object. That indirect object, if you have it in Greek, is normally put in the dative case. And it serves in the same fashion. And so El Shemuel, as a uh, adverbial modifier, if we want to refine this further, to map that type of thing out, then we would go up here and we would take the uh, diagram and uh, put an insertion point here and then go to our uh, table menu, go to the insert part of the table menu, and go to a row above, or rows above. And when I return then, that will enter a row above where I was at. Now because I had a box there, I'm going to have to manipulate that box back down in its, in its place. If I grab hold of it here first. Yeah, so I can keep it where it needs to go. And I've got then a space here, a, an empty row below that line where I can then go up and I can take El Shemuel. I can cut it out from there. I can paste it into the box below. And then I can select that box, that cell, so that I can manipulate its borders. And I'm going to select it. I'm going to manipulate that right border to where I would put El Shemuel about halfway underneath uh, Wayomer, just like that. That is the adverbial modifier of Wayomer. 
It's indicated by the fact that it's halfway underneath. It's not at the same right vertical margin as Wyomere, so it's not equivalent to it grammatically. It is subordinate to it. It's that same situation if you use Lee Cantonwine's uh, grammatical uh, diagramming. If you uh, have, uh, for example, uh, good God, the good God, ha theos, ha agathos, uh, you diagram that in this fashion, all right? You have a stick here and you put the line and you bring it down, it goes about halfway underneath so you can see that it's an adjective modifying theos. Well, that's all I'm doing here except I'm not using lines. It's just done spatially. It has put into space in such a situation, such a setting that it's halfway underneath what it modifies. So if I wanted to refine it that way, to that fine of a detail, then that's one of the things I can do. Then as we go into the dialogue, if I want to do something with the dialogue, uh, how long are you going to mourn over Saul, uh, but I have rejected him, or so, or but, or because, depending on how you translate this context. Again, I could take El Shaul, and I could drop it down. And if I go in here and I insert, uh, excuse me, got to do the table, table insert and go to a row above and get that row in there. And it's going to expand my uh, box area. So I'm going to move its bottom border down to include the whole thing. And I want to take out El Shaul. literally over Saul, uh, why or, or, or for whom, for whom are you mourning? And I'm going to stick it into this box for, the, for a second here. And I know I'm going to need extra space. So I'm going to merge these by going back to the table menu, going to merge cells. Those two will be merged. And now I want to bring that over because it is an adverbial prepositional phrase modifying the verb, which is a participle, mit abel. And I'm going to put it about halfway underneath mit abel. And uh, that takes care of it there. We've got it taken care of. All right. Notice that wa ani is still vertically aligned with the previous personal pronoun ata which it is being contrasted with. Because there's a contrast being made here very purposely with the emphatic ani, the emphatic first person singular pronoun as the subject for the cal perfect first common singular verb ma'asti because you don't have to have ani, it's already there, it's the t in the verb. So the subject's already inherent in the verb. So if we use the personal pronoun in that setting, it's emphatic. The personal pronoun with the participle is not emphatic because participles, remember, do not have person. They have no person. There's no such thing as a first person participle, second person participle, or third person participle. They have no person. So if you're going to specify a subject of a participle, you either have to use a noun or you have to use a personal pronoun. And most of the time, a personal pronoun is utilized. And its normal position is in front of the participle. It will occur about 60% of the time in front of the participle, about 40% of the time after the participle. And there's no emphasis in that word order. So there's no emphasis there. It's not saying you yourself, as the following is saying, I myself have rejected him. But there is, by context here, by the use of a knee, a an intentional drawing of a comparison between the actions of Samuel and the action of God. He's saying, why are you mourning over Saul when I, and he emphasized that, I, I myself, Samuel, listen to me. I'm the one who rejected him. Now, that has a great deal to say, to imply about the, the matter of Samuel's attitude. He's behaving a lot like people do in our churches when we uh, engage in church discipline. A lot of people sit around and they moan and they groan and they bewail the fact. 
and they mourn over the situation and they go home and worry and fret over the situation. They get on the telephone and do all kinds of gossiping and everything else because they cannot accept that this is God's demand. That we're not, they can't accept that this is being done according to the commands of the word of God. They're, they're doing the same thing Samuel was doing. God says, get over it. This had to be done. This is the right thing to be done. This is my will. It's my doing, Samuel. Why are you questioning me? Get your head on right. Quit having your pity party and let's get on with things. It had to be done. It's right for you to be grieved, but don't continue grieving over it. You're carrying on like a man who doesn't really believe that what I did was right. Samuel, what does that say about your faith in me and your concept of me? And that's the contrast being brought out here. And so one of the things I would do in this, for my, because I have a color printer at home, I would go in to fine tune this, and I would take the two personal pronouns, and I would put them in red. So that when I look down at this diagram, when I'm preaching my sermon, that jumps off the page at me, I see that contrast, and it means something to me. Because it says there is a conflict here between two people, two persons, two personalities. Between Samuel and God. And it's a contrast between the way of Samuel and the way of God. The thinking of Samuel, the thinking of God. And that's one of the, the themes of this entire text, is it not? You see, this sets the stage. This is the background. As we get further into the text... Samuel's going to see Eliab and uh, he's going to say, wow, that's got to be him. Look, he's tall. He's handsome. He's strong. That's got to be the leader. That's got to be the king that God wants me to appoint. And God says, no way. I have not chosen him. The opposite of I have rejected. And he tells Samuel, after he's done this several times, he says, look, it's not what a man sees because man looks with the eyes on the outside, but God looks on the inside. And that key word through the passage here, ra'ah, see, is what keys that whole concept. And that later verse is the key verse for the entire section. But the concepts begin here. There's a contrast between what God thinks and what man thinks. There's a contrast between what Samuel thinks and what God thinks. This sets the stage for it. And this is part of the whole thing. And we have to catch that. And those personal pronouns are grammatical clues for us. Especially a knee. Because if we just had a ta, that's not unusual. That's normal. That's natural grammar. That's not extraordinary. But a knee is. And it helps set up the contrast in that close association. And we've got to catch that point. If we don't catch that point, we don't catch the focus of this passage and we don't begin to inculcate that and introduce it into our sermon soon enough for our people to catch that concept so as we go through the passage they leave there saying wow I got it I got it I need to be careful of my thinking that I'm not like Samuel that I'm thinking constantly in a human fashion looking at the exterior and not looking the way God does at the heart I need to yield myself to what God does. I need to quit sitting around and bemoaning the fact that we've indulged in church discipline in our church. I need to quit mourning that and questioning it. And I need to get on and do what God wants me to do. I need to do God's will, God's way. You see my point? This is significant to preaching. You do not find this in the English. You can look at this in English all you want. You're not going to see this focus. You're not going to see this emphasis in the use of the personal pronoun ani here in verse 1. And if you diagram it, you give yourself time to get so involved in the text that it has an opportunity to come to your attention. All right? If I drive by my yard... Uh, I might think, hey, that's a nice looking yard. That's all right. Guy keeps it up. No trash out there, etc. But if I stop and park out front and look for a while, I say, well, it's been a while since he's uh, trimmed the shrubs. Or uh, something must be wrong with the sprinkler because there's a brown spot in the lawn or whatever. And if I'm the one out working on the yard, I notice all kinds of stuff. I mean, even the small little stuff. 
a little plant back here died, or a rose over here uh, is now all dried up, or, or I need to trim this shrub, or I need to do this, I need to do that. I notice all the things. I find out where all the stuff froze this winter. You see, I find the dead stuff, even the small little ones that used to be there but now aren't there. Because I've taken the time to get involved with it. And that's what diagramming does for you. It gets you involved in the text. Because as you're fooling around with this text, cutting and pasting and looking at it and trying to figure it out, you're giving that time to register on your consciousness as, hey, there's a pronoun here. And there's actually two pronouns here and they're close proximity. Why? Is there anything significant about that? And then we can begin that process of researching to find out and asking those questions so that we then can analyze it. So gentlemen, use diagramming as a means of getting closer to the text, of getting involved in the text, of immersing yourself in the text. It will give you an opportunity, a time to see things you have not seen and perhaps would not have seen in any other way. Even if you translate it from the Hebrew, you may not have seen it. But when you take that extra time, you spend that extra time, you do that extra work, you have that extra involvement in the text, some of these things begin to appear. And let me tell you, it never ends. Every time I return to a text, I see something else that I missed before. It's an ongoing process. That's why we never exhaust a sermon when we preach it. Ask Dr. MacArthur how often he's preached a sermon that he couldn't come back and improve it and add to it later. When he was talking about the Gospel of John, he was telling us that uh, the first time he preached through the Gospel of John, uh, the notes are about half as long as what his book's going to end up to be. In fact, he said actually it's perhaps maybe only a third because he's learned that much more, twice to three times as much. He's learned an intervening period. That's the way we are. We're going to be that way. I don't care how exhaustively you attempt to preach text, you're not going to exhaust it. Because we have a limited finite mind. And we're not going to be able to do that. And so we just preach through the text and we grow in the text and later we can come back to the same text and preach it again and add to it, have more because we're beginning to see more. And sometimes it's because of the fact that we're not ready for it spiritually. Do you ever wonder why you preach a sermon or you teach a lesson and why some people get the point and others don't seem to get it at all? Others are sitting there and they come by and they say, Pastor, thank you for a great message. Or someone come by and say, Teacher, thank you for this lesson. This is what I'm taking away. And they tell you what they take away from it. You say, that wasn't my point. That wasn't my point. But you go back to the text, you say, but it is there. But that's not what I was bringing out. <laughs> but they had their Bibles open and looking at it. And the Holy Spirit ministered to them where they're at. Because God knows a sheep and he knows what food a sheep need. And he provides for them. And he uses you as the one directing them to the table, to the food. But you selected a certain meal out of all the food on the table to present to them. But they rearranged the food or took a certain part because they needed one of, part of that food more than what you did or what someone else did. And so they go out with a truth that you may not have emphasized but was in the text because that's what God the Holy Spirit wanted to get because they needed that and they weren't ready yet in spiritual maturity to receive the truth you were emphasizing and bringing out. And all we have to do is be faithful to text. Dr. MacArthur says that time and time again. You be faithful to the depth of your ministry, the depth of text. God will take care of the breadth. And that includes the various applications to different people in different times of their lives at different stages of growth. This might not appear to you the first time you go through this text. It may be the third time you go through and it may be because now you're ready to see it. Maybe now you're ready to see the overall focus, the weight of evidence that talks about the contrast between how God thinks and man thinks in this text. And the next time you preach it, you've got greater passion and greater depth. And God will use it to reach out to a wider audience and a wider group of needs. All right, so El Shaul is halfway under Mit Abel to modify it adverbially. The same as Mim Lok down there, and I see that I must have uh, chopped off the Hirik. So I'm going to add that in here. Uh, Mim Lok, Al Yisrael is a prepositional phrase that is an adverbial modifier of Ma'astiv, 
I've rejected him. From what? From reigning over Israel. Fill your horn with oil. Now Shemin as an adverbial accusative. It's a double accusative. You fill the horn and it looks like fill oil, but you don't fill oil. You fill with oil. So it is the material. You could drop Shemin down halfway underneath Malay if you wanted to. Now, you have to make a judgment here, call at some point. You have to say, okay, how far do I want to go in refining this and making the details? Number one, I have to figure, how much space do I have on my page? Um, maybe I don't want to go into great detail because I want to keep it all on one page or two pages rather than going to five or six pages. Perhaps it's not necessary. Shemin does not need to be divided out and put down there underneath Malay unless I keep having a problem as I look at it and I keep thinking that Shemin is uh, something else in the relationship. And then maybe I need to diagram it down halfway underneath Malay to remind me that it is adverbial in nature. With what do I fill the horn? Then we go to the next line. Will lake Eshlachaka. Here we have lake being used as an introductory imperative. An introductory imperative. Uh, that's found in section 2.2.4 of Hebrew Bible insert. The introductory imperative is not really to be translated. It is merely to show a sense of urgency. God isn't saying here go and I will send. Notice there's no and on Eshlachaka. It's not saying here, and don't preach it this way, I've heard it preached this way, you need to go first and while you're going then God can finally direct you and then he will send you. But you can't be sent until you go. And I've heard people take that and go to the Great Commission and say it says here go into all the world. And if you want to be sent as a missionary, you want to be sent as an evangelist, if you want to be sent to someone to breach them for Christ, you've got to be going first. So you, you make certain you get on your jacket, you go outside, and you start walking the streets with tracks in your hand. And if you're doing that, then God will send you to someone. But if you're sitting at home, he's not going to send you. Or if you're sitting in the pew, he's not going to send you. If you're sitting behind the pastoral desk, he's not going to send you. You probably heard messages like that as well. Maybe you didn't hear them based upon this passage the way I have. But that's not what this means at all. The Hebrew grammar indicates that lake is an introductory imperative and all it contributes is a sense of urgency. I will send you immediately. Fill your horn with oil. I am sending you immediately. Right now is the concept to Jesse the Bethlehemite. Now if perchance I was focusing on or trying to get a concept of a narrative and the characters in the narrative because narrative involves plot, it involves scenes, it involves characters. And we have to do character studies and character analysis. We have to understand, okay, who is Samuel? Who is Yahweh? Who is Jesse? Who is David in this context? And we have to have a clear picture of who they are and how they work into this narrative. That's part of the narrative uh, study that you must do. If I want to highlight that, then I might want to do like I did with El Shemuel above there in putting it adverbially underneath Wa Yomer. And the way I handled El Shaul under Mit Abel, I might want to put El Yishai Bethlehemi underneath uh, Esh Lachika. So that I could highlight that. So just because I might want to do that, let's go ahead and go back to our table. Let's insert a row above. Excuse me, it wasn't supposed to be a row above, but I'll make that work anyway. We'll make it work by just taking off the front part and moving it up. Wanted to go to a row below. All right. And let's get the box readjusted here. Sometimes you may want to leave your boxes until you get uh, everything done. All right. Get rid of this over here. Sometimes programs are too intuitive. They get in your way. All right. And I'm going to take this and I'm going to move this border over. If I can get hold of it. 
may have to move the box out of the way to do it. I need to re-highlight the cell. All right, now I'm going to move that over underneath Eshlakaka. All right, now if that's part of what I wanted to do, if part of what I want to do is to highlight these characters involved, then maybe I want to also utilize a uh, color code for characters. And so maybe I want to highlight that by using blue there for the reference to Samuel, blue for the reference to Saul, and blue for the reference to Jesse. And that then tells me who the lead characters are so far in this story. And that is only for the purpose of reminding me that I'm in narrative and I'm dealing with characters. And part of preaching narrative and teaching narrative is dealing with the plot of what is the story is all about. Dealing with the theme, dealing with the purpose. What is the purpose? What is the uh, nugget of truth? What is the propositional truth that's being developed and stated and illustrated by this narrative? What's the point God wants us to learn from this? And we have to keep in mind, narrative is not necessarily prescriptive, it is descriptive. So we're not saying by this that since Samuel had to fill his horn with oil, that we ought to fill our horn with oil, all right? <laughs> Be careful of that. If I see you walking around with a horn filled with oil, I'll wonder. But uh, rather than that, being, that action being prescriptive, it is descriptive. And the description is given in order to teach us something. Because remember, all scripture is what? God breathed, meaning it is given by God. Therefore, it is authoritative. It is inerrant. And it is profitable. That's co-equal to inspired. It's profitable. Every scripture, every part of scripture that is inspired is equally profitable. All right? There's no scripture that's inspired that is not profitable. It's all profitable. Even the genealogies are profitable. And they're profitable in four ways. For what? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, those are the four things that God, through Paul, addressed Timothy about that we ought to then be aware of. So as I approach a text like this, I've got to ask myself the question, okay, is this inspired scripture? Absolutely. Number two, then it is profitable. What is it profitable for? Doctrine. What does it teach me doctrinally? What does it teach me about the doctrine of man? What does it teach me about the doctrine of God? What does it teach me about the doctrine, go on down the line, doctrine of sin, homardiology, go all the way through the categories. What does it teach me? It may not teach me about eschatology here, but it teaches me about the doctrines of personal life and personal holiness. It teaches me about the doctrine of God and his sovereignty. It teaches me about the doctrine of the sinfulness of man, how even a believer can, uh, who is a prophet can be disobedient to God can miss what God's will is, that's doctrine. Then reproof. What is there in this text that reproves me, that faces me with my sin? Well, since I'm a man like Samuel, and I'm a believer like he's a believer, is it possible that I may also be doing things that are displeasing to God because I have not yielded myself to his sovereign control over my life? And to his arrangement of circumstances around me in my life, in my ministry, in my family? Yes. Then I've been reproved. I've seen myself in the mirror of the word. I've seen myself in Samuel. Now what's next? For correction. What's the corrective here? And we look for the solution. What's the correction for Samuel's problem that I can identify with? And I find out that God's correction for this was for him to pay attention to what he was saying, to obey God and to keep on serving him in the things God wants him to do and let go of the past, let go of Saul, let go of that rejection. Change my heart and change my mind. And if I can't do it, I need to ask God to do it for me. And then... Instruction in righteousness. What do I learn about righteousness in this text? And one of the things I'm going to learn about righteousness is that God's righteousness is so far above man's righteousness because God looks at the heart where we look at the external things. God looks internally. And he's dealing with internal righteousness, not just external righteousness. And we've got it. 
And then the next point is going on in 2 Timothy 3.17 says that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. The scripture, and this is still talking about all scripture, every scripture, including 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1, not only provides me with doctrine, with reproof, with correction, and instruction in righteousness, it is intended to equip me for good works. So then I need to ask, how can I put this to work? How can I do this? How can I live this? Not just believe it. I need to be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. You see my process? You're wondering how to preach the Old Testament? That's how you do it. That's how you deal with narrative. That's how you look at these things. And to do that, You've got three people here involved. At least. We're going to get down to David later. We have four key people. We have God. We have Samuel. And they're the two that we see the most of here at the beginning. And then we're going to have Jesse. And Jesse plays a role in this. And then we have David. And David is going to be one of the focal points of this narrative. And we have to understand who those four are. We have to understand a little bit about the background. If you're preaching this text, you want to tell people who Samuel is. You want to remind them that he was that child serving in the tabernacle under Eli. You'll have to remind them that he's the son of Hannah. You need to give them some background. They need to understand how he came to this point and why it's disconcerting and so disconcerting that God has to intervene and confront Samuel. This is the boy who used to listen to God carefully. Who listened to him more carefully than Eli did, the priest. This is a man who's been through trial. Who has lost his own sons the way Eli lost his sons. But he hasn't yet learned it all. Even as an old man, he's still learning and he's still being taught by God. And so this touches upon every person in your audience. Whether they're in the stage of Samuel as a child... Or if they're in the stage of Samuel as an old man, we still have things to learn. And in different stages of life, there are different things we learn and there's different things we face. And sometimes the difficulties of life and the raising of children and the losing of children bring us to a point where we really latch on to someone else that we become close to. So much so that we replace God with them. Like Saul in the life of Samuel. So we have to talk about people. And so this highlighting it in blue reminds me as I go in the pulpit that I have to set the table in my message. This is narrative. In narrative, I have to expose the plot of the text, the flow of it, the plot, the purpose, the basic propositional truth that is going to be given. And I have to introduce the people to each of its characters. And I have to develop them because the scripture develops them. They are full-bodied people. They have lives involved. And the reason the story is being given to us is because those lives are significant. An entire book, 1 Samuel, has almost been given over to Samuel. And all of 1 and 2 Samuel is nothing but to lead to David. So we have those two characters here. And the whole thing is as God sees them, as God calls them, as God uses them. He's the third main character. Jesse turns out not to be a major character. But we have to talk about him because he's in the text. Several times in the text. And there's some involvement here. Because he himself doesn't understand that it's David who's the one. Who is the chosen one. So we have to do this for our people. And part of the way we begin that is sometimes, if you're like me, I have to go through and I have to highlight these. I have to diagram them and I have to use colors to remind me of the significance of these elements in my preaching this text. That's why when I see that and I'm in the pulpit and I look down and I see those blue phrases that mark out the characters in this narrative, I'm reminded I need to let the people know about this. When I see the red there of the contrast, I need to let them know that this is the background, this is the contrast, this is the conflict that is going to be resolved by the propositional truth of this text. And the truth teaching begins now. It doesn't wait till verse 7. It's already started. And it's emphatic. And God's the one who has placed the emphasis. It's in his speech, not Samuel's speech that, it occur, uh, that it occurs. This is God's word. This dialogue especially is directly from God. And it is his will and his way. So 
That's how we get involved in the text. All right? Now, we have, uh, let's take about five or ten minutes for questions before we take a break. Are, I know I've taken time to get into preaching and I've got on my soapbox on a few things. But gentlemen, that's, listen, why are you taking Hebrew if you don't want to preach? I mean, that's the reason you're taking the language. And you don't want to preach the text from someone else's English translation that may have errors in it and that may hide some of the truths because it obscures them because English can't express them the way Hebrew does or Greek does. You want to get into the text yourself. You want to be directly face to face with the text. You want to remove the veil from the text. You want to kiss your bride. Not through the veil. All right? And that's what you do in translation. You're kissing your bride through a veil. You want to see it. You want to deal with it. You want to get so saturated with the text that that's what overflows and goes to your people because you want to saturate them with the text and desire to know it and to understand it. And so you're here to learn Hebrew because you want to preach. And you want to preach the word the way God gave it. You want to bring out his focuses, his emphases. You want to major on what he majors and you want to minor on what he minors, not the reverse. We're taking Hebrew to expound. That's why the third semester next fall OT 603, Introduction to Hebrew Exegesis, has five papers. The last one is a sermon. Because we're just a, as the title of our textbook by Chisholm, From Exegesis to Exposition. We're learning Hebrew because we want to preach the text. That's why we're here. So that's why I get a bit passionate about it. Because at heart, I'm a preacher. And that's the reason I learned Hebrew. That's the reason I use Hebrew. That's the reason I teach Hebrew. All right, enough of that. Questions on diagramming or something that I've said so far that you have a comment on, question about? Yes, sir. So really, from what you're saying, too, it's not, or there's not really a specific, real, 100% right way of doing it as long as it helps you clarify the text and align things. And You hit the nail on the head. Linda? Yeah. You hit the nail on the head. That is exactly it. Remember, it's, it's, it's artwork. It's artwork, and every artist sees something differently. Now, remember, the text is objective. Its truths are objective. Its grammar is objective. All those things are objective, so we're not going to violate those things. But there are some things, for example, you might choose not to separate out the individuals the way I have with blue, because there's, you say, well, there's really no need. I, I've got that so much in my mind, uh, it, it's not going to leave me, so I'm not worried about missing it. Uh, and so you can just leave them back in the text. You don't even have to drop them down to make them adverbial modifiers. Uh, you can just leave them up in the text where they were. Uh, those are your choices. It depends on what, what speaks to you to help you say exactly what the text says. What is the tool in this that will help you in your expounding the text? And you use the type of things you want to use to do it. All right? So there's a very subjective element here, personal element. And you might diagram this text uh, differently than I, although you'll maintain the same word order. There'll be certain relationships that'll be the same and identical, but there'll be some that won't be. Question. What do you use to discern how much detail to give on the narrative people? I mean, like you said, there are people that will gather things from your message, that may be armed in it. Um, and so do you just want to try and do the best you can to give a narrative background based on what you're teaching? Or do you want to bring them up to speed to everything that's been talked about in this book, assuming you know, someone's reading this narrative? It depends on, on how much time you want to spend in this text. Uh, if you want to preach a series of sermons on 1 Samuel 16, uh, then you have plenty of time to use an introductory sermon that will go back through, develop the history of the book of Samuel to this point, the first 16 chapters, and to orient the people to who the main characters are, let them know who they are. Uh, if you're going to just do one sermon on this, you want to be very brief and succinct in what you give. You want to give it quickly, briefly, but clearly. So it, it depends on how you believe God is leading you to develop it in your own uh, pulpit ministry. If you're invited somewhere to give a series and someone says, I want to invite you to do a, a series of three messages, what do you want to do? You could say, well, I'll do all of them on 1 Samuel 16 and do that. Or if you're invited uh, to preach somewhere and they say, you only have one sermon opportunity, well, you're going to have to make it shorter. 
And in your own pulpit, uh, how much time do you want to spend in 1 Samuel? Why are you in 1 Samuel? Are you in 1 Samuel only because something in the New Testament has brought you back to it, perhaps a mention of David, and you're trying to go back and give your people a concept of the origins of David and his kingship, etc. So you've come to 1 Samuel to help them understand that and set it right. Uh, you might not even be preaching on the main propositional truth here. Uh, you might be just using it as an illustration. So all those things will determine how much time you spend and how in-depth you go with developing those characters. But for your own study, you need to have fully developed them for yourself so that you know them so well that when you condense it down, if, you, if you're going to just give a five-minute introduction dealing with the characters, that you know it so well you can do that and do it well. So for you, you still want to do the in-depth analysis, whether or not that's what you give in the message. Okay. Anyone else? Other questions? Comments? Yes, sir. When you do this, uh, when you outline before you preach the text, how much time do you dedicate to this task? Well, you can see here what we've done in just going through and diagramming with explanation as I've gone along. Uh, we've spent, uh, what, about uh, two and a half to three hours in here talking about this text. Now, in my own diagramming of this, I can sit down and do it in 10-15 uh, minutes for the entire chapter. Uh, very quickly, just cut and paste, cut and paste, in getting the basic outline, and then to develop all the details, put in the dialogue boxes and things like that, uh, then it's going to take a bit more time. I'd say maybe an hour for the entire chapter, maybe two hours if I want to really spend a lot of time with it. But that's because I've been working in Hebrew and teaching Hebrew for 38 years. So you're looking at the text and you're saying, okay, but that's going to take me a lot longer. Well, that's one of the reasons why you have to get familiar with those disjunctive accents, the major disjunctive accents. They are the clues that will help you divide this text quickly and efficiently and give you something to work with. And uh, then go back and fill in the details and make your adjustments. Um, when I'm preparing a message... I like to prepare a message weeks in advance. I'm going to Albania here in a couple of weeks and I'm preaching a series of messages on the authority of scripture. Uh, four messages. I've been working on those messages for weeks. And um, that's the way if I were a pastor, I would want to not just prepare each week for my message that week. I would want to, to prepare ahead. And if I've been caught up, I told one pastor this, this last week, he said, I just don't have time to spend that much time in preparation. I, I, I have to, every week I have to get going in, again on that message for that Sunday. And I said, well, look, you know, why don't you invite someone into your church to fill the pulpit for you for a couple of Sundays and give you a chance, not just to go out and play golf, but you take the opportunity to get ahead on your sermon preparation. You figure out where you're going in your sermons and what you're going to preach and you spend those two weeks that he's there filling the pulpit for you. You spend that time getting ahead so that you're two to three weeks ahead of your curve and then keep it ahead. Maintain that pace. Always keep studying ahead. Use the first part of the week to study for the next sermon a month from now and the middle part of the week to study for the sermon that's three weeks from now and the end of the week to study for the sermon that's this Sunday. But that you're not studying it, you're just going back over it, reviewing it, and revising it, etc. And becoming familiar with it once again. And once you get into that pattern, then you've got it nailed. And then you have the time to develop things like this. Otherwise, you just don't have the time. If you're going week by week, you don't have the time to sit down and do much, especially if it's narrative. You don't have time to diagram narrative. Uh, you barely have time to read the text and uh, read all the commentaries. Uh, unless you're dealing with a small amount of text, you don't have time to do a lot of diagramming. So you've got to plan ahead. Plan ahead. Plan now. Why not, while you're in seminary, choose your assignments and choose your papers to help you prepare a series of sermons that you'll preach when you finally get in the pulpit? Begin now. Start doing diagrams now. If you want to preach through Samuel, start diagramming it now. Every opportunity you get during the summer, every other time, start reading commentary, start preparing sermon outlines, start keeping a file of notes, and prepare that first series ahead. And if you go into your first pulpit with a series already prepared ahead of time, then you can merely review that each week, but you can be working ahead then on the next series. So use your time in school wisely. Choose your assignments well and, and use them. When you have that opportunity to choose a sermon next semester in uh, OT 603, 
Choose a text you really want to preach and choose a text out of a passage you want to develop into a full series perhaps. I want to finish out what I had started earlier with regard to verse 6. I told you we'd come back and take a look at it because we have a temporal clause here. We have a macro syntactic use of wayihi. And uh, I want to try to explain how I would diagram this, how I would demonstrate it. Because remember, the number one rule in logical diagramming of Hebrew is never, ever, ever change the word order. Never, ever, ever change the word order. All right? So that means that if you have a prepositional phrase that intervenes as an adverbial modifier of a verb between the verb and the subject, you want to always keep the verb and subject on the same line. So therefore, you will not separate out that adverbial modifier unless you're dealing with a chiasm where you're going to put each on a separate line in a descending order and then come back out of the chiasm with parallels to it. You don't want to do that. And so there are certain rules here. And in verse 6, we face that rule of not changing word order because wayihi vevo am is an adverbial modifier. It is an adverbial temporal uh, phrase created by the infinitive construct with the base preposition that means when, when entering. And the subject is the am ending, the third masculine plural pronominal suffix, when they were entering or when they entered. And wayihi is just kind of introducing this. And it is macrosyntactic because at this point you have a break in the narrative. Because, notice, in verse 5, you've gone all the way through the sanctifying and the preparation and the summons to the sacrifice. And so all that introductory stuff is over. You're finished with the dialogue between Yahweh and Samuel, which is the first part. You're finished with the uh, uh, traveling to uh, Bethlehem and the entering to Bethlehem and the encounter with the elders and then meeting Jesse and giving him the summons. And now we're going to the sacrifice itself. So the wayihi here helps to introduce a change in scene. There's a scene change that takes place. If you're filming here, you're going to do a transition of some sort to, to show this. And it is while they were entering. All right? So, wayihi bevo am is adverbial modifying wayare. And I see here again, I, when I cut this off, uh, I uh, took off the pathak. You always have to watch that uh, if you don't cut and paste correctly and catch the vowel. Uh, I want to make certain that it shows that it modifies. So, I'm going to take and select this cell. And I'm going to move the right-hand border of that cell over halfway over Wayara because that is what it is modifying. And then because it precedes, I have to leave some sort of visual clue that tells me this, that Wayahi Vevoam doesn't belong to what goes before, it belongs to what follows. And so I'm going to go back down into my auto shapes menu and I'm going to get the uh, block arrows here, because I like using them a little bit here and there. And I am going to uh, choose, whoops, get the block arrow here, and I'm going to choose uh, this one here. I guess will work all right. And I'm going to, uh, I shouldn't have done that. I put it on, got something there, but that'll be all right. I'm going to bring it over here, and I'm going to uh, uh, reorient it to where it is pointing down. And I'm going to put it in this way, and I see it's a little bit too large, so I'm going to decrease the size of it a little bit here. All right. Okay, you can see Dr. Farnell is equally passionate about Greek. All right, we share a common love of these languages, and we get passionate, and uh, we can get... Uh, carried away as well. So when I'm yelling in here, he's over there and his students are wondering what's happening over here. When we're singing over here, they're wondering what's happening. And when he's doing that over there, you're wondering what's happening over there. You're just getting the benefit of two guys and excited about the languages, all right? Uh, this arrow then helps to show that. And if I take out all the 
paragraph markings, you can see it a little bit more clearly. You still have a little bit of the gray lines that are marking the cells, but those aren't real borders. They won't print. The only borders that are printed are like the black one down there around the dialogue. But that is how I remind myself that Wayihi Vevo Am is modifying, it goes with Wayara. All right, and I maintain the word order. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Yes, question. I, my cells suddenly started not even having the gray lines when they're disappeared. Just disappeared completely? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's uh, something in your program or maybe it's something in your preferences. I don't know. Uh, I'll keep working on yeah. it. And if you can't figure that out, ask someone around here who's a bit of, more of a computer geek than either one of us, all right? <laughs> Someone's probably got an answer to it. James? How do you rotate the arrow down? Uh, the way you rotate the arrows, when you, when you select it here, see that little green thing there that I got the round circle around? Yeah, that's, that's how you do its orientation. You can just move that or I can go down here to the draw toolbar and I can go here to rotate or flip and I can do the rotations there as well. So either way I can get it done but I can manually manipulate it up there with that little green dot. I can just grab hold of that, put my uh, cursor on it and click on it and then I can uh, rotate it everywhere I want, any way I want. Manipulate it by hand. That one, huh? Sure, be glad to. All right, I went down here to the auto shapes on my toolbar. I went to block arrows. Actually, I need to click somewhere here outside of this first. Uh, get to auto shapes, go to block arrows, and then select my arrow and uh, bring it in. And I selected it here, selected the bent arrow because I'm going to be pointing it differently. Ignore my tool palette. That's part of my preference problems. I could probably remove that if I took the time, but I haven't. And then uh, you get a, a uh, cross form there that uh, then you utilize to draw it. You can draw it out as large as you want, big as you want. And then when you release it, you've got your green spot there where you can rotate it down the way you want it, make it point where you want it. And then all those other little points, those little empty white circles with little black lines around them are the ways that you adjust its size, how thin it is, how long it is, and uh, then you just move it into place. And it'll fit right over the top of your cells in a table or uh, you can place it in text or whatever. Okay? Now do you have to use an arrow like that? No. Do you want to just leave it on the same line ahead of Wayara, yes, you can do that. Another, and in other words, here again, it's a matter of personal choice and preference. It's a subjective thing as to whether or not you separate it out this way. It's a subjective thing whether I use an arrow. I could also done the same thing by maybe highlighting Wayhi Vevoam where it's at and Wayara, and making them all green, for example, to show they go together. I could use color instead of arrows. There's any number of ways we can do it. And so, uh, you know, you're not locked in to any specific way of doing everything just as long as you are faithful to the grammatical relationships, you don't violate those, and you don't violate the Hebrew word order. Now, let me go back to that for a minute, because some of you are looking to say, well, why not just violate it? Why not just drop it down below Wayara? Because in Hebrew, word order is everything. If I drop it down below Wayara as an adverbial modifier, which it is, I've changed the word order and then as I look at the Hebrew then I cannot see that you have the macro syntactic Yahi being used to initiate this text, to begin this new section, to introduce this scene. And in other cases, as we'll find out in Exodus 15, 26, uh, next semester as we go back and look at it or as you even look at it here, by the way, if you pick up this sheet again on diagrammatical analysis of the Hebrew text and you go to the sheets there that have Exodus 15, 26, And uh, you go there to the bottom of page four and you see the kol uh, hamachala and you go over to page five and you see how I've moved that over to the left and I, oh, I hope that the vowel pointings haven't gone to the right the way they did on mine here, on yours. If they did, that's a problem I have between my computer and the printers in the office. 
and uh, IT fixed it once for me where they would print correctly and now it looks like it's not cr printing correctly again. So I don't know what that is. We may have to have them come up again. But uh, anyway, you'll see there that I've moved it over more to the middle because it is the direct object of the verb with the negative, lo asim. I will not place all the disease which I placed on Egypt upon you. And I've retained that order very carefully because kol hamachala is an emphatic, it's emphatic word order. And if I change that and put it down on the line right after the verb, then I would lose the word order and I would lose the clue, the visual clue that tells me the text has that first and it's emphatic for a reason. And we'll talk about that uh, when we come to it next semester in going through it in detail. All right? So maintain word order. Don't violate word order. John? Uh, this is more with New Testament with Greek, Greek, but will you, will you use the same sort of diagram with Greek or would you rather use a line diagram? I have tried to use logical diagramming with Greek. Greek isn't as logical as Hebrew. <laughs> it does not work well in Greek. Um, there's so many things about the Greek that just create difficulties. There are some texts that work nicely, but a lot of texts just do not. I still find that I use the grammatical diagramming like Canton wine for the Greek, and I use logical diagramming for Hebrew. I find equally that the grammatical diagram for Hebrew doesn't work well, the way you have to chop up words and everything else, change order. Uh, but, um, I, you know, I would still use logical diagramming if I could on a Greek text, and I have in the past, but there's some that it's just very hard. It be becomes difficult. All right? Okay, anyone else? Any other questions? Do you feel like you could do this now if you were to choose a text and try to go through and, and uh, try to at least arrange it? Remember you go through and you note the major disjunctive accents. And again, what are the major disjunctive accents? Don't look for tipcha and all of those. Look only for these. You look for the athnak, which is the l main logical divider of a verse. All right? Watch for athnak. You can begin there by separating the two halves of the verse. Then you go internal to each half. And internal to each half, you watch only for the revia, which is the diamond, and the zakef katon, which are the two dots above. Now, on occasion, you'll see another, and I'll just put this up like this, just choosing the word, but sometimes you'll see what looks like an inverted segol. That is segolta. Segolta is a major disjunctive accent. And it is always a disjunctive, and it is primarily used in those situations where it is introducing either direct discourse and often a negative direct discourse, or it is introducing something that might be negative in concept. Uh, it's not always negative, but there are a large number of cases where it is. It's been selected by the Masoretes for that type of thing. But the Segolta will be one of those that will be an exception to the Zakef Katon, the Ribia. And the other one is where you have the zakef katon, but you have a line beside it. Zakef katon, zakef gadol. This is called the greater zakef, and without the line, it's the lesser zakef. The interesting thing is, the lesser zakef is more primary, it is stronger than the greater zakef. The greater zakef is called it because it's larger in visual size. That's the reason for gadol. It's larger in size, but it's not larger in its impact on the verse. But if you know those accents, you've got them all. And if you just go through a verse and you start dividing a verse according to those disjunctive accents, and you stay with them and you just do them line by line, just start out at the right-hand margin, or even center them, and just go through and separate it that way, you have done a lot to divide it. And especially if you're in poetry, gentlemen, if you do that in poetry, you have divided that into its poetic lines. And you're way ahead then in poetry. So uh, get to where you recognize those disjunctive accents and utilize them. Let them help you. Remember, you need to also observe them when you're doing translation. When you're translating, don't try to translate the entire verse all at once. Translate section by section up to the disjunctive accent. 
because what's on one side of the disjunctive accent should not be attached to or confused with what's on the other side of the disjunctive accent. Now there are some cases where it will continue the thought on, but be very careful about jumping across. Don't take elements that are aft on one side of the disjunctive accent and move them into the translation on the other side of the disjunctive accent unless you have very clear cause for doing so. And never do that with Athnac. <laughs> You'll get yourself into deep trouble. You'll get things associated there you don't want to have associated. So uh, watch out for that. But pay attention to those disjunctive accents. Okay, questions? Yes, Jeff? On the wagon tolls for your diagram in all ways? Um, I try to divide out all the wagon tolls because in narrative, they mark the steps, the sequential steps in the narrative. It's more key in narrative. Yes. And that's because they're characteristic of narrative. Right. All right. If I were in prophecy, I'd be doing that with wekatal, with the wow plus perfect. The wow correlatives I would be doing that with because it shows the logical flow of the uh, uh, text in prophecy. So in narrative, yes, the wayuk toll is very key and you want to make certain that you can see that. I want to see the steps, the sequential steps of the narrative as we go through. Now keep in mind there are times when the wayuk tolls of the narrative, uh, they're like a chain. They move along in a chain and it's one step after this. This is before this and this is before this and they're all in sequential order. One, two, three, four. But there are times when a chain will reach a certain point and it'll stop and the narrative will begin again starting back at a previous chain and have a new chain of events develop off of it and these are sequential. One, two, three, four, five. So you have to watch for that. And if you have a situation like that, you want to make certain that you demonstrate that. What happens is these may be the main points and these are the sub points to this third point. And you will show that by bringing it over and making it subordinate. If Wayomer here were subordinate to Wayara uh, starting a new chain, I would then put Wayomer indented underneath Wayara, as though it were adverbial in nature almost, to show that that has branched. And then when I go back out to the main chain again, I go back out to the right margin again. But remember, they're always sequential. And I say always advisedly because we already had an example where it isn't. Right here with Wayahi, that's a Wayik toll, but it's not necessarily a sequential here. Is being used as a temporal modifier. It starts a sequential part of the narrative, but it is actually subordinate to the following Wayik toll, Wayara, because of its mat macro syntactic nature. And so, as we've learned here in Hebrew, uh, there are many rules in Hebrew, and there's exception to every rule, including the one I just gave. There's probably some rule that doesn't have an exception. All right? As soon as you make a rule in Hebrew, you're you're in for trouble. That's, that's why Chisholm gets on to people about calling Wayik Tola preterite. He says it's inaccurate and it is, uh, what's the other word? Inconsistent? Inaccurate and inconsistent? I forget what the terms used there, but one of them is inaccurate because Wayik Tola isn't always a preterite. All right? Only about 80% of the time. 20% of the time, it's a future or a present. And so uh, to call it a preterite, in narrative is fine because most Wayik tolls, the vast 99.9% .9 plus of Wayik tolls in narrative are going to be preterite. Preterite is just an old fashioned word meaning past tense. And uh, they're not past tense because they're inherently past tense because Wayik toll has no inherent tense. As he also says six times, tense is inherent in context and context alone. Hebrew verb forms don't have inherent tense or time. Uh, why you told can be a present, it can be a future by context. Context determines time, not the form. And uh, so in narrative, the context, the very nature of the genre is past tense. And the context is what makes the way you told a narrative a preterite, not vice versa. It's not the way you told that makes the genre a preterite. All right? <laughs>